Welcome to Dallas Dog Talk, everyone, where the subject is always canine welfare. I'm your host, Susan Stroh, dog trainer, canine nutrition enthusiast, and all-around dog lover. Dallas has a stray dog problem. Did you know that? Most people involved in animal welfare in some way or another within our city are keenly aware that there's a problem in South Dallas and West Dallas, but even in parts of the city where you don't expect to see stray dogs, you will still find a few. What do you do when you come across a stray dog? I see them all the time when I'm out with my dog. It's scary and it's sad. Today's guest found her beloved dog in her middle-class, well-known neighborhood of Swiss Avenue in Fitzhugh. She's going to tell us her stray dog story in just a moment. But first, a word from our sponsor. Today's podcast is brought to you by Raw by Canines First, a holistic food supply store for dogs featuring the very best in canine nutrition. When you buy your dog's food at Raw by Canines First, you'll be taking food home to your dog that will give them vitality prolonged health, fewer vet visits, less dental issues, a healthier coat, and brighter eyes. Raw by Canines First carries grain-free options from kibble all the way to raw with options in between. Visit Raw by Canines First at either of their two locations on McKinney Avenue or Inwood Village in Dallas. Raw by Canines First cares about your dog and all of the many others within our community that haven't yet found their forever home. They support local rescue efforts and donate their very nutritious food to the rescue organizations within our community. Visit us, mention this podcast, and you're going to receive a free trial size Nature's Variety Instinct raw frozen food. Your dog is going to love it. My dog loves it. That's what he ate this morning. Today's guest is Erica Warfield. She is a realtor with Dallas City Center Realtors and a good Samaritan to the animals of our city. Before I knew Erica through dogs, I would have called her a cat lady. She does wonderful work with the feral population, and she has much to teach on that subject, but today I want to talk to her about the dogs she's found on the streets over the years, how she's helped them, and specifically her story about her current resident dog, Betty. Welcome to the show, Erica. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Now, when I first met you, you brought me this Jack Russell Terrier. (laughs) It was horrible. I guess I should have said Jack Russell Terrorist. He was, I'm not joking, in 15 years, the most outwardly aggressive dog I had ever met. He wasn't defensively aggressive. He would start the fight. And you left him with me for a day or so, and I had to protect myself from him with a metal chair at one point. He was coming for me hard. (laughs) Oh, my God. But God bless him. You saw him on the street. I think you said he was having a seizure, and you knew you had to help him. Yeah, that little dog, he, um, I was, I was working with a, a feral cat community, and I was on my way to go feed them, and I saw this dog having an epileptic, well, I didn't realize it at the time, it just freaked me out, it was very, very scary, uh, but what I found out from the emergency room vets was that he was having a grand mal seizure, and I had never seen anything like that, and I think if he had not been so completely incapacitated, he would have gone after me too. For sure. But because he was in that kind of a state, I was able to kind of grab him and eventually get him into an, a carrier. But I had to carefully get him back to my place and then get him in the carrier. And he wasn't having it. He Even with the seizure, he wasn't having getting into the carrier. It was scary. And it was, I remember it was Christmas or Christmas Eve and nobody was open except for the 24-hour place. And so it got to be a pricey proposition, but well worth it to save his life because it turned out he was microchipped and there was an owner, but nobody could do anything because it was Christmas. So I was out driving around trying to find who his owner was and it turned out the owner had passed away recently so now came the idea that I might have to foster this little guy and he wasn't just any Jack Russell he was a Jack Russell Chihuahua mix which just really kind of added to the aggression (laughs) and then I don't know what his owner had been thinking but they had named him Cujo and I thought if you have an aggressive dog don't name him Cujo because if he had been found by anybody other than me he he probably would have been put down I mean, to be aggressive and then be named Cujo, um, and then to find out he had a record 
of having, you know, bitten somebody else before. But he was, he actually saved my life in a way. He, he was funny. But I did eventually get him back with his family, so to speak. When you found him and he was seizing, what did he do when he came to? I, I guess he found himself in your car? He, he was, <laughs> he pretty much was seizing the whole way. I mean, uh, trying to carry him without getting bit, you know, back to my place, trying to get him in the carrier, trying to get him over to the vet. Uh, eventually he was seizing less, but he was in a state of shock. I think he had done some damage, maybe to his brain cells or something. I don't know what exactly happens, but he was pretty tired and he was just very chill once he got to a place of being in shock. Uh, once he got to the vet, I had to warn them, I don't know what this guy's going to be like. You know, he did attempt to bite me, but he's seizing too much. He, I never, I didn't get a chance to see him completely chilled out until he was sedated. That is really very sad for that little doggy. I, I can imagine he was on the streets for more than a few minutes as his owner had passed away and he wasn't being taken care of. Mm -hmm. You can only just imagine how he got out. Okay, so... The doc checks him out. You take him home to your then husband yes. and all your cats. I mean, your few cats. <laughs> and tell me, how did those next few days go? I know you came to see me during that time. And then at some point, you found a friend of his owners that had passed away what was your time like with him while he was in your care well I first thing I had to do was change his name he was not going to be <laughs> called Cujo and uh, my then husband at the time made fun of me because I, I had picked a Christian artist to name him after a musician and so he became Nate Sally which he thought was kind of a girly name but I was like he needs something to kind of soften the edges while we were going through that process I had to take him for a checkup to my vet and at that time, that was Katie Trail Animal Hospital. And he ended up biting me. And so immediately, he had to go into quarantine. And then we took him over to Hillside. And they had him in quarantine for, I don't know, whatever it is, a week, 10 days. It was horrible. I had to go visit him every single day, twice a day, to make sure he was okay. And then somebody over there wasn't following instructions. And they got bit. He was in quarantine another week to 10. It was ridiculous. I think he was in quarantine. And, and he had his shots because that's what they did, you know, at the 24-hour emergency clinic. So poor little Nate. Um, <laughs> by the time he got done with that, he was like, I'll behave. I'll be good. <laughs> I won't do anything else. Just take me out of here. Uh, so when I got him, I had bought a crate. I started crate training him per your instruction because I think right after that the first thing I did was all right I'm breaking you out of here we're gonna go see Susan this is ridiculous you're not gonna go through this again but once once we started crate training him we didn't give him any access to the cats because we just we couldn't trust him but it, in time he became my buddy and he would ride with me in the car and he would keep me company while I was doing any kind of cat trapping or working with feral cats and he just kind of kept me company eventually the owner's partner we managed to get in contact with each other he had been placing signs up and I saw one of the signs eventually and um, no that's not how it went he did place the signs up I had not seen the signs but I eventually decided to contact him through some information that the 24-hour emergency vet gave me mm -hmm. you know off the chip and um, it took a while to track him down but we we did get in contact it was good and and that was it and then you gave him back to the man after that. And I know you and I tried to work with yeah. that man and the dog. And, and I hope that they lived happily ever after. As far as I know, they did. You know, Nate, Sally, and we ended up renaming him Mac. And that was his deceased owner's last name. He didn't like Nate Sally. And I said, well, that's fine, but you can't call him Cujo. That would have gotten him put down. And so we decided Mac would be the acceptable name for him. And that's what he went by. He was still a little on the nutsy side he was still aggressive and I and I told you know his Terry at the time um his owner a new owner you know this is what you're gonna have to do and I think Terry came in I, I think I introduced Terry to you I don't know if Terry ever kept it up but from last I heard you know everything was still good good yes I remember at our first meeting he was a little defensive but he did return and we did some work and I explained to him Max um, issues would be ongoing and how to just better manage him so that nobody gets hurt and you know that little dog isn't euthanized for anything that really isn't his fault it's it's I really believe it's the owner's responsibility oh, when yeah. a dog is aggressive yeah. you know even 
let's say you do everything that you can to help a dog not be aggressive. That's good, and you should. But if you get to a point where the dog, his, he just has limitations with his disposition, you've got to manage him or her or, and keep them from hurting anybody so that they don't end up eventually getting euthanized, which is what happens a lot. Because a lot of people, they just stay in denial about it. They've, they've got their own psychological issues, and, and they won't face the reality and take the steps necessary. And it just admit to themselves, my dog is a biter. But God bless him. I hope he will be all right. Was he the first dog you'd ever pulled off the streets? Oh, my gosh. You know, I have pulled so many animals off the streets. I think that he may have been the first. Although, you know, I have girlfriends I've helped out who their thing is to pull dogs off the streets. So, but yeah, I, I would say he, he probably was. He probably was my very, very first. Um, my, I've helped my parents when they've pulled a pit off the street and, and thank goodness he, he was owned. He was microchipped within after the weekend was over. You know, he found his place too. He was beautiful. He was a beautiful pit. Um, but yeah, Mac was sort of my first and then came Betty. That was a lot of dog drama. And then I didn't see you again for a while. And then you, you showed up in group class with the cutest pit bull. <laughs> She's got the most beautiful green eyes. And she's white. And then are her patches fawn in color? She's pretty much an equal distribution of the dark caramel color and the white. She's got one caramel colored ear, one white ear, white face, black nose. And she's tiny, tiny, tiny for a pit. That's what everybody says when they see her. Is she, is she in fact a pit? And I, I think, I, I really need to get her a DNA test. But I think she's a staffy, a Staffordshire Terrier. And she's really kind of fun to walk because uh, true to Terriers, uh, Mac was this way too. They have to sniff everything. So there's a lot of stopping on our walks. But she's getting better about that now with all the training that we've been undergoing. I mean, she understands come this way, leave it. And, and because of your training, she follows through with that now. She is a petite pit. She's so cute. When you brought her to class, you, you all looked so adorable. You're little. <laughs> and you like to wear skirts, and you look so cute, and then and, and here you are with this pit bull. It, it was really a cute sight, and, and at that time, Betty looked fantastic, but Betty didn't start out that way. She did not look good at all from the pictures that I've seen. Tell me the story from the beginning. I want to know when you first started to see her on the street. Before you rescued her, you saw her and knew her in a way. And, and what did you see happening to her? The f I think the first time I saw Betty, I didn't realize it was Betty. It wasn't until a month later I, I realized, oh my gosh, that was that dog. So the first time of my conscious recollection was she'd clearly been abandoned. And she had made a little nest out of some um, landscaping along the side of someone's driveway near where I lived, Swiss and Fitzhugh. And she wasn't moving. And my then husband at the time said, there's this pit. She tried to, you know, scare me and, and the pugs away. And he had tried. <laughs> she, it was very a half-hearted attempt from what I understand. I think she was just scared. Um, but he had tried to pepper spray her. And it malfunctioned. And he pepper sprayed himself. <laughs> <laughs> Which, that was my first clue. Okay, I'm supposed to help this dog. <laughs> and then he said, but you know, she just kind of half ran at us. And it was almost like she was just saying, don't come near my space. She wasn't aggressive the way Mac was. Mac was scary. I mean, for all whatever, 22 pounds of him, he was scary. And here was Betty at 48. And she was just scared. So he had, he fed her. He took some canned food out there and, and managed to get close enough to feed her. And then I, that was my second clue. Okay, she is not dangerous. I had to go do something. And he had come back and said, if she's still there later in the day, I, I, I need you to go back and get her. <laughs> I'm like, you mean the dog you just tried to pepper spray? You want me to go put the leash here? Okay. And so I, I did my thing, and six hours later, I was back, and sure enough, she was still there. So I, I always carried a leash in the car with me. I went out there. It took me 15 minutes. I finally got the leash around her. And she tried that half-hearted growl, but it was obvious. She was just like, I want help. I really want help. I want to trust you. And I said, well, I'm just going to outweigh you then. And I eventually, I got the leash on her, and she followed me over to my SUV. And, 
and I had on a, a hand knit alpaca sweater. I had hand knit myself, and she had never gone up steps. She'd never jumped into a car, and so she couldn't get up in the SUV. And what I discovered was apparently whoever dumped her had weaned her that day from her puppies because she was fully engorged. She was leaking milk everywhere. She was filthy. She stunk. Please, you name it. I mean, not not something you want to touch, much less wrap yourself around wearing your hand knit alpaca sweater. <laughs> and um, I had to pick her up, and she leaked all over me. She leaked all over the comforter in my back seat, and she was so hungry she started drinking her own breast milk. And then we took her over to the vet, and that was Vickery Place Animal Hospital, who was my vet at that time. And we got her checked out, and uh, she ended up having a uterine infection from the birth. I mean, literally, and they said, too, you know, sh- you can't see it. This is a beautiful pit. But she, her teats were hanging. They were filthy. I, I-, I can't go into, I-, I can't say enough how malnourished she looked, how mistreated she looked. There was a haunted look in her eyes, it just like she had been through a lot. Somebody had used that dog for their purposes and dumped her like she was trash. It's so sad. We, driving along, we've got... A list of 10 things to do and 20 places to be and we see stray dogs and our heart just breaks for these animals we have to take so much into consideration whether or not we're going to help them like our own safety but in Betty's case she had sort of camped out and you kind of got to know her by watching her and watching her reactions and you had some interaction with her before you were before you decided yourself that you were going to help her. Well, God bless her. So what was her recovery like? How long did it take? And not just her physical recovery, which I'm sure was a bit challenging and exhausting for her, but also her emotional recovery because you were so brave to bring her into your home having no clue what this dog had been through. So what were those recovery days like? Betty always, she, and that's why I think it was a front when she went after, you know, my my then husband and the pugs, because once she came in and I still had the crate from when I had Mac, and so immediately she went in the crate and we thought, okay, we don't know how she's going to be with cats. If she's going to chase after them like they're squirrels. So, you know, let's just be really cautious. We don't know how she's going to be with the pugs, you know, because we, we had remembered Mac. <laughs> And how careful we had to be. Betty came in and was immediately grateful. She was immediately sweet. She was immediately trying to make friends with the pugs. She knew her place. She knew she was at the bottom of the totem pole, and she allowed that. She, I guess she'd be what somebody would call a beta dog. She was just like, I'm just happy to be here. In terms of her recovery, we couldn't do anything about the infection until we could take her in to have the hysterectomy and, you know, get her spayed. And that sort of cured it itself. But most of the time, she got pampered. Um, she was so filthy, and we found out she was afraid of water, so we couldn't bathe her. So she was getting sponge baths. And literally, she would lay on the couch or in my ex-husband's arms, and we'd flip her on her back just to be able to clean in between her her teats. Because, I mean, literally, it was just a swamp down in there. She was pampered. (laughs) I think she thought it was spa day each and every day of our household. Uh, And so she loved it. And she gained our trust pretty quickly. And, I mean, even to this day, she mothers my cats. She mothered them back then. She mothers them now. One of them can sleep on her, like literally on top of her. When she's in a cone and she doesn't feel good, Betty will rest her cone on a cat and go to sleep. So they're very, very, very close. And she, if one's getting feisty, she will make sure that that stops. You are not going to pick a fight. She'll corner him and put a little paw on his head and say, knock it off. Um, <laughs> there shall be no alpha stuff going on. So she's just, she's she's the best. She, she of all saved my life. She literally saved my life. She's so cute. I've said it a hundred times how cute she is. When you finally got her cleaned up and, and you got some weight on the girl, you decided that she was going to be a good girl and you brought her to training And you taught her a lot of things. And one of the things I thought was so cute that you took the time to do with her was to teach her how to ride along your bicycle. Tell me what um, 
your life is like with her on a daily basis now, now that she's recovered, now that she's trained, now that she's adorable? She gets a lot of attention. As you'd mentioned, I like wearing skirts, so I wear a lot of vintage. And Betty, it it took a lot to leash train her. I, I think before I came to see you, there was months and months and months of leash training and having to go see the chiropractor because she was leash averse. I mean, there, there I had weekly visits to my soft tissue chiropractor, and it was all because of Betty. But once we went through the training with you, that when we started doing the prong collar and it was really the prong collar that helped me the most with bike because without that prong collar she thought she was a sled dog and she would literally pull me on the bike I I couldn't pedal fast enough but once the prong collar went on we get it's a vintage bike I'm usually in a vintage skirt and then I've got a crocheted skirt guard over the back wheels so we're kind of a sight as we go up and down (laughs) Swiss Avenue (laughs) Um, it's a candy apple red vintage bike it's a step through and it's it's just it's funny people literally Literally, when we stop to potty her, and she'll let me know I need to potty right now, and I know to slow down, people will always stop us. So she is quite the spectacle, and I think that people can't help but fall in love with Betty. I mean, they just see her, and they just all gravitate towards her. She's in studio today, and she uh, acted like she remembered me. Yeah. She was so precious. I'm so happy to see her again, and And she did seem happy to see me. Thank you so much for pulling Betty off the street and any other dog that you see and all the work that you do with the cats as well. Tell me about Betty and your rescue efforts with the cats. How has Betty's rescue and your rescue efforts with the cats affected your business? You know, it's funny because I didn't think it would. I mean, something like this affects you on a personal level, and it, it, it literally changes you forever. And so what I decided to do with my business, and people can see it. I've got videos on my website. I designed and built my own website at, at Live in Dallas. LSTX.com, especially if you go into the what's in it for you link. But what I've got there and what I'm going to say now is for anybody, I, I make donations to rescue groups now based on my business model. I will not move forward with anything unless I do a donation in someone's name. So for example, for the video on my website, if somebody just agrees to interview me, if they're wanting to list their house or they're needing a buyer's agent, I will make a $100 donation in their name not my name, in their name, to the Dallas Cat Lady or to Safer, which is one of her organizations, which is Stray and Feral Cat Rescue. And they get a a thank you letter for their records for tax purposes saying that their donation is acknowledged and and we thank you so much for it. So that's that's one of the areas that I will make financial donations. And, And they don't even have to use me. They may decide to go with some of the realtor. I don't know why you would do that because nobody else is <laughs> trying to help Dallas Animal Services out because that is an underfunded and overutilized organization that needs help. And so through Safer and through the Dallas Cat Lady. Um, now, I've not done anything through dog rescue yet, but I would not be opposed to doing something through Paws in the City. I just have these relationships already built. And I know for sure they're going to make a record of it and they're going to get a thank you note saying we did get your donation versus I I don't have those relationships yet with uh, with other organizations. So that's that's just one of the ways I support them financially after the sale of their home or the purchase of their home on my end. I then go and make other donations for myself. As, as part of an offering, um, in addition to whatever I do in my church, I will also make an offering to the rescue organizations. So it's very much a part of my business model, and I don't think it ever would have been had I not gotten involved with, you know, cat rescue. And more specifically, it, it was sort of Betty's rescue that finally made me say, you know, this needs to be a part of your business model, and you get the word out this way. That's perfect. I am so glad that you do that. Thank you again for coming to visit us today. And I want to remind everybody to go to Raw by Canines First on McKinney Avenue or Inwood Village. You mentioned this podcast and get your free trial size Nature's Variety Instinct raw frozen food. I want to tell everybody that Paws in the City is going to be at Lakewood Whole Foods on Saturday, June 20th. Please go see the dogs they have to show you and show them your support. Thank you so much for listening to Dallas Dog Talk today. Once again, this is Susan Stroh signing off. I look forward to chatting with you again on our next podcast.